Hello, hello. Wow. Good to see everybody. How was that uh, quantum leap? That was pretty awesome, huh? I appreciate uh, Ben Kinney's candor. Um, certainly, it takes a lot to not only get up on stage in front of 15, 18,000 people, but to share a story like that is, is pretty powerful and, and pretty impactful. So uh, we appreciate you know, anyone that contributes this week at Family Reunion and, of course, uh, what we just went through um, with Quantum Leap. All right, so let's jump in because I'm told we've got 75 minutes and uh, I've got about three hours of material to give you in about 75 minutes. So I'll make sure that uh, we get us out of here on time and on with dinner or whatever else we have going on tonight. Um, you know, interestingly, when they called and said, hey, could you do something on listing presentations? I'm always wondering how they determine, you know, uh, let's pick this agent to talk about this, let's pick this agent to, to do this. And, you know, I think about, okay, what does my day revolve around every single day in this business? And even to this point, uh, it is the listing presentation. Uh, you know, when I think about everything that we go through, right, from the time we get up from, till the time we go, bed, go to bed, in the sales business and in the real estate business, regardless of whether you're running a big team or you're a listing agent on a team or you have some other businesses that you're working in, everything revolves around the listing presentation. And you know what's interesting about this, I think over the last probably five, six years, since all these technologies have come out, uh, all of these new systems and, and, and internet leads and so forth, we've kind of gotten away from the basics of going out and taking listings and, and revolving our business around this. And so going back to the, the, the thought I had on, okay, so I guess the reason why I may have been considered for this is because everything I think about every single day that I wake up and when I'm with our associates is how can we get more listings? How can I help you get more listings? How can I personally take more listings? Because I know that everything in this business revolves around that. And if that isn't the key takeaway that you get from what I'm about to share with you for the next 70 minutes or so, then you miss the presentation. Because that is by far, without a doubt, the number one thing that we have to think about every single day when we wake up. How can I get a listing? How can I help my people get more listings? And what do we have to do to take more? And so what I'm going to cover with you today is from start to finish, right, from A to Z, exactly what we're doing. So let's jump in. Okay, my name's Jeff Glover from uh, Plymouth, Michigan. That's a suburb of Detroit. Okay, I see some of the Michigan ganders in here. Appreciate that. Uh, in addition to running a sales team, I'm in sales, I'm in production. I'll close about 180 transactions this year myself. Our team combined will do just under or just over 1,000 right around there. Uh, Volume-wise, that'll be about uh, 200 some million. You gotta sell a lot of homes in Michigan uh, to get the volume up. So. Real estate sales is my game. You know, obviously I'm involved in other businesses as well. I'm the OP of a couple market centers. Uh, um, I'm, I'm a partner in a title company and some other businesses as well. But this is what I do. This is what I live and breathe. I wake up every single day and think about how can we get more listings? How can I get a listing? So let's jump in. Okay, what we're going to cover today, we're gonna to cover five things. First of all, the basic strategy of listing presentations. Uh, the information that you share when you're on a presentation. I'm going to give you you know, uh, uh, from start to finish, hey, this is what's happening when I get out there. This is what I'm doing. This is what we're teaching our associates to do. Uh, the pre-listing package, the anatomy of the listing presentation, what it actually looks like, and a few visuals, give you an idea of some visuals that you should be taking with you. <clears throat> okay, next slide, there we go. Obviously, with everything we're doing right now, what I, one thing I love about the CGI is it, it tracks everything for us. You know, when I first started in this business uh, in 2000 and three now, yeah, 2003, uh, our tracking system was pieces of paper, uh, you know, a daily log sheet, and at the end of the week, adding up all of the totals manually. Now we've got the CGI, it does it for us, so uh, obviously take advantage of that. All right, strategy to the listing presentations. Favorite part. One thing I want to talk to you about right now, and, and I think about it when we're putting together our daily goals, you know, our weekly goals and our, our, our business plan for the year is kind of going back to the thought of, okay, 
there's a lot of different ways we can get business, right? We can buy business, we can wait for business, we can go out and get business. And I think about it, and I'm constantly having to sell my people and anyone that I talk to on the values of being a listing agent. So I just want you to, ha I just want to kind of wrap your mind around some of these thoughts and feel free to write them down, but I just want you to think about, okay, if I'm going to do anything when I go back, I am going to make the commitment to focus 100% of everything I do every single day on listings. So when I say that, what I want you to think about, no, point number one I have written down here, do you want to be the employer or the employee? Do you want to be the employer or the employee? Because when you're working with buyers, you are the employee. The employers are all the listing agents that are taking great listings. You know, they're working Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They're grinding it out for five days, and then they go on vacation for a weekend while all their employees show all their listings. I don't know about you, but I don't want to work seven days a week. I don't want to work nights and weekends. I'd rather be the employer. So I think about that every time I say, okay, would you rather be the employee or the employer? Being a great listing agent makes you the employer. The other thing I wrote down is the one-to-one -one ratio. The one-to-one -one ratio, it may have been a while since you've heard this. I remember someone teaching me this early on in the business, and that is this. For every listing you take, you will have one transaction. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It almost works down to the T. If you actually go back and look at, now of course, if the business is skewed because you're buying a lot of internet leads or you're spending a lot of money, your ratio may be a little bit different, but for the most part, for every listing you take, you're getting one transaction. And I think about right now, in 2016, we probably averaged 60 to 80 listings a month, and well, we ended up with 950, 980 sales. Now that doesn't mean that every single listing we took sold, what that means is we of course either got a call from a lead, a uh, internet, a uh, bu you know, buyer called the sign, or that seller went and bought a house. What's interesting about that statistic is that the same thing goes when you're working with buyers. The studies show that for every buyer that you meet at a property, for every buyer that you've built rapport with and you feel like this is going good, you're only going to close 50% of those transactions. So if I'm going to spend the time, why wouldn't I do an activity where one to one, not one to a half, not 50% of the people that I get in good rapport with actually end up doing something with me. I want the people that are definitely going to be selling, I'm gonna get leads from those signs and I'm gonna go out and, and sell them something. That's the one to one ratio. It's been around for years. The other thing to think about is, of course, the, 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 the timepiece, right? We've actually calculated, there's, there's people that have done this and I would encourage you guys to do the same thing. The time it takes from start to finish, from a listing taken to a listing closed, versus a, a, a buyer meeting or a buyer consultation to a buyer transaction is almost double or just over double. So okay, well, if I can cut my time in half and do the same amount of transactions, what else could I do with my time? Or the way I looked at it is I can work the same amount of hours and double the transactions. Now of course I know there's successful agents in the room that work with a lot of buyers, and by the way, I work with buyers too. We just utilize a showing agent model. So that way our time is spent in the more listing presentations. Point number four, this has stuck with me for years, and that is if you generate you don't have to tolerate. If you generate, you don't have to tolerate. See, you don't have to put up with the buyer's schedules and wanting to see homes on Sundays. You've got an inventory of 10, 15, 20, 30 listings. You don't have to tolerate if you're generating. And finally, number five, your client, your client retention is higher. If I go out and get a listing, if I get a listing contract, and, and there's an offer on their property, we put the deal together and it falls apart, I still have a listing, right? Say yes, okay. But if I'm working with a buyer and we go out and see homes and they've decided on a property, we write the offer, we get under contract and it falls through, is there a possibility that I may lose that buyer? Of course there is. See the listing, I still have the listing. So there's a greater chance I'm going to close more transactions when I'm working with listings. Okay. So let's talk about 
what we should expect from listing presentations. So the National Association of Realtors says that a realtor should list one out of every four presentations they go on. Not very good, is it? No. Now, I would, it's interesting because when you think about that statistic, there are how many personality styles when you think of the disc? Four. Okay, so there's four different personality styles. We're one of them, and we're going out to present to an individual that may be one of those four styles, and oh, by the way, we didn't get a contract signed because we weren't in rapport, or we didn't meet their style. So there's no wonder that they say you're gonna close one out of four. Well, there's four different personality styles. So my question is, do you have four different presentation styles? Or are you going out and presenting yourself and your material and your data and your plan of action and your paperwork in the way that you think is most comfortable for you? I hear all the time, well, you know, I, I, I want to use, you know, I, I have my own scripts. How's that working out for you? Well, you know, I'm comfortable with these. I'm com this is the way I like talking to people. And this is the way I would want to be, uh, uh, you know, the information delivered. Okay. Well, that's you and you're one of the four. So I would challenge you to put together, and I talk with my agents all the time about this, we have four different presentation styles for pricing property, for presenting the plan of action, for touring the home and having a discussion while we tour the home. Because if we're going to increase the ratio of gone on to taken, we have to be in rapport. Well, how do you be in rapport? You learn their style and you adapt to them. It doesn't revolve around you, it revolves around them. The minimum standard for a, a Jeff Glover and Associates agent is 60%. That's the goal. Hey, I'm not asking for 90, I'm not asking for 100, 60%. Six out of 10 appointments you go on, you take. That's the minimum standard. Now, you may be saying, well, hey, you know, I, go, I take 90 or 90 for 5%. Well, the question I would ask you is, are you only working with people you know? Sphere of influence, past clients. Right? One of my early mentors always told me, Jeff, there's two types of people in this world, people you know and people you don't know. Which group is bigger? The people you don't know. So I always went after the people that I didn't know because that pool was bigger. And now what's nice with all the systems and CRMs nowadays, we have things that automatically drip and drop and follow up with the people that we do know. The other thing when we talk about the listing presentations is delivery time. How long are you on that presentation for? Our minimum standard is you are not on that appointment for more than 45 minutes, and there's a few reasons for that. Number one, you better be ready to get to the next appointment, or number two, you should be coming back to the office and prospecting for another one, or negotiating a contract, or doing an income-producing activity. 45 appointments, or I'm sorry, 45 minutes. Well, wait a minute, why would you cap it at 45 minutes? I go out there and I do a pretty good job of building rapport and I'm in and out in three hours and 10 minutes. Okay, that's how you end up taking five listings a month. And you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, but I'm building good rapport and I'm at least getting those ones signed. Yes, but how many are you losing by being there for three hours? And oh, by the way, every single book on sales out there tells us that after a certain amount of time, we go from being a salesperson and asking great questions to talking. And you could probably finish this, this line, selling isn't telling. Exactly. It's asking questions and letting them answer the questions. So my goal is to be clear and concise. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not, I'm not rushed in and out in 45 minutes if I get a contract signed. If I don't get a contract signed, I want to be in and out in about 30, 35. Okay, so take a look at how long your presentations are lasting right now. The, the adaptability was the versatility, right? We know the disc. We know that there's the driver, the, the high D. We know the expressive, the high I. We know that S is the amiable. C is the analytical. Have a presentation style for each one of those personalities. 
I'm not going out and presenting the same material every time, uh, the same way every time. It's the same material, but it's a different dialogue. It's a different line of questions. It's a different level of rapport because I'm molding myself to them. Next, when we talk about listing, you know, a thousand homes a year, and I know this sounds so basic because we hear it over and over and over again. Practice your scripts, practice your scripts, practice your scripts, right? It's, it's like you, you pretty much walk into any panel this week and you're going to hear practice your scripts in every single panel. Well, I want to share with you what practicing scripts means to me. And, and when I say that, I'm going to just share exactly what I did to get good at my listing presentation. And what pre my definition of practicing is the following. It's simple. It's three parts. And you're going to look at it and say, wow, that's a lot. Okay. Do you want to have a lot of listings or do you want to have a little bit of listings? If you want to have a lot of listings, you have to do these three things. This is where I started. And by the way, when you join our firm, we go through this every time with people. Number one, I took the listing presentation. N not complicated. It didn't take 90 hours a week. I wrote it out one time per day for 30 days. The basic listing presentation. You can get it from your team leader, your maps coach. It's only a couple pages long. Once a day for 30 days. I didn't focus on anything else other than, you know what? I'm going to write this thing out once a day for 30 days. In fact, I was forced to do it because I was fortunate enough to find a mastermind early in the business that let me in. You know, they were all closing 75, 80, 100 transactions. And, you know, I was doing 35 or 40. And there were some requirements to get into this mastermind. This was one of them. I had to email them every day, handwritten, right? You couldn't make copies. You couldn't type them out. You had to handwrite them. Well, there's, there's something, that, something to be said about handwriting scripts, right? Because when you're writing it, you're reading it. You're thinking about it. You're committing it to memory. Wrote it out once a day for 30 days straight. Next, this was a 90-day process, by the way. Three simple steps to mastery. And we just talk, you know, get, it's interesting. I love when Gary Keller was talking about mastery because I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, it's such a simple principle. We want to do all these other things. Right? He had the slide that had, you know, uh, money, spiritual, financial, you know, he had all that slide with all those up there. And Matt, commit to mastery. It's like we want to skip that one and go do all the other things. We want to just kind of jump over that one and, and say, you know what, there's got to be a different way to do it. There's got to be a better way to do it. There isn't. It's mastering the basics. The second thing I did for 30 days after the first 30 days, once a day, I, chant, I took those scripts that I wrote. It was two pages. And I chanted it aloud by myself one time per day for 30 days. You want to talk about committing to mastery? And this isn't even complicated stuff. The same script that I wrote out for 30 days. I had it memorized by then. I just took it once a day. And this is what it sounded like. Right? It's just literally reading off a piece of paper, measuring listening presentations. How do you know if you have a good presentation? Conversion rate, delivery time, adaptability to different personality styles. I just read it to myself aloud. Once a day. Committing it to memory. And then finally, the next 30 days, I role played it one time per day for 30 days. I'm not asking for 90 hours a week here. Once a day, it'll take you about 30 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on the rate of speech. You'll commit it to memory, and that is, in my opinion, that is mastering the listing presentation. Writing it out for 30 days, chanting it for 30 days, and role-playing it once a day for 30 days. You've got it down. You're good. You, will, you, you could leave right now and go out there, and 90 days from now, of course, we're going to have to wait 90 days to see the results, but 90 days from now, you can increase the amount of listings gone on to listings taken by probably 5 or 10% just by this one thing. Next, when we get to the presentation, what is it that we share? What do we take out? What kind of conversations do we have? You know, I have in my notes here to make sure we talk about versatility. And I've already talked about adapting to the four styles. And when I think about, okay, we hear the term versatility and adapting and, and, and being in rapport. I wrote down the four things, in my opinion, 
the four things that everyone should pay attention to when they go out on a presentation. So when you heard me say, hey, if they're, if they're a high D, play to the high D. If they're a high C, play to the high C. Well, well, what does that mean? Play to that. What does that mean? I'm going to give you those four things right now. There's a rate of speech. Number one, rate of speech. Okay? If I'm presenting to a seller and they're, you know, I'm talking kind of fast right now. Well, half of that is nervous energy. Okay? Uh, so if we're out of here in 10 minutes, sorry, you know, do something good with your time. No, I'm kidding. Uh, if I'm talking fast, and naturally I talk fast, I better not talk that same way when I get in front of someone that's talking slower. I have to pay attention to my rate of speech. So I just have this mental thing that goes off. Rate of speech. Jeff, watch your rate of speech. Watch their rate of speech. I'm paying attention to their rate of speech. Number two, very important, their tonality and their dialect. Their tonality and their dialect. And I know it sounds silly, but sometimes, you know, I'm up in Detroit, so we talk a little different than probably some people in the South. But when I call someone that I can clearly tell that they're from the South, I'm changing up my tune a little bit. I appreciate you taking my call today. My name's Jeff Glover. I'm with Keller Williams. I'm changing that dialect. They are not thinking I'm crazy. They don't know any different. This is how I talk in their opinion. Does my rapport level go up or does it go down? If I'm matching their rate of speech, their tonality, and their dialect, it goes up. Say yes, right? It goes up. The next thing I pay attention to is their body language. When I'm on the presentation, I'm watching their body language. And we've heard it, right? And these are all basic things. You know, this isn't rocket science. The difference is, is I'm actually making a mental note to watch them and to see how they respond to certain things and to make sure that the way they're sitting, I'm matching the way that they're sitting. And if their hand is kind of, you know, doing one of these, I'm going to slowly do one of these too, right? If they're crossing their legs and leaning back, I'm going to cross my legs and lean back too. How uncomfortable is it if, if they're crossing their legs and leaning back and I'm leaning forward and pointing and demanding? No. Clearly they move at a slower speed. This is a casual meeting for them. So let's be in rapport. I'm sitting back. I'm, being, I'm watching their body language and I'm matching and mirroring them. And definitely number four, this is probably the most important one. Always, 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 no matter what the circumstances, no matter who they are, their personality style, their dialect, where they're from, always, under all, all circumstances, play to the wife. Okay? The wife is making that decision at the table. I'm playing to the wife whenever possible. You know, and I get the question sometimes, well, if you spoke to the husband on the phone, then obviously you've got good rapport with the husband, and you know he's an analytical, and he likes facts and figures and details and data. Um, why wouldn't I go on the presentation and present that based on what I know? You will. But at the same time, as a great salesperson, it's your job to quickly identify the significant other personality style. And what's nice about the personality styles is generally speaking, what's the old saying? Opposites attract. So if I know that I'm talking to an analytical on the phone, I may have an expressive or a higher eye back at home. Right? It's amazing how many appointments you go on, you'll see that they are exact opposites in their personality styles. And I know that that's going to happen 80% of the time, so guess what I'm doing? On my little lead sheet, yes, I still have paper lead sheets. I just write, husband, driver, wife, amiable. I'm assuming that if the husband's a high D, that the wife may be an amiable. And I'm just keeping that up here until I get to the house and I may realize something different. But 80% of the time, it's right. Next. Let's talk about your value a little bit. So what are you sharing? What are you talking about when you go out there? Well, I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm sharing with agents all the time to do the same thing, especially if you're brand new. 
Use your office stats. Use your team stats. Use your market stats. Use something to make it look impressive. Use something that shows you and your organization have sold a lot of homes, even if you've sold none. Take out the information to show them of what the market center's done, your team's done. It doesn't matter what you've done at that point. Now, of course, on the other side of that, if you've been in the business for a while, you have a track record, do the exact opposite. You're showing them exactly what it is that you've, you've uh, what you're able to do for them, what you're able to accomplish, your stats. I have written down here, use examples of homes you've sold, homes that your market center has sold. Think about it, how often do you go on a presentation and you know, you've got the comps and so forth and you're, go, you're doing your thing and, and you're going through the comps, this has happened to me plenty of times, you're going through the comps and say, oh, it looks like we sold that one, all right, cool, yeah, that's one we sold, yep. That's definitely one of our sales. Instead of finding out when you're at the table, go through the neighborhood, comb the neighborhood, and look for all the listings that you, your company, the market center has sold, and bring examples of those out. It's amazing how the consumers to this day still want a local expert. And it doesn't matter how long ago the sales were, I mean, I'll go five years, I don't care. I know they want a local expert. So I'm gonna show them examples of homes that our market center has sold in their neighborhood to build our credibility. I have written down here, your resume. It can be from a previous business. You know, if you haven't been in the business that long, but you've been in sales, or you've been in some other profession. Talk about what you learned in that profession and how that's going to help you in the real estate business. Later, I'll show you an infographic that we use that demonstrates our value. It's a simple one-page infographic, and it is information about uh, you know, myself and our market center and Keller Williams. It's just a really simple, if you look at this, you know, all the things that, here's what, who we are. This is our story, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Next, the marketing plan. It doesn't have to be complicated. My favorite is a simple one page. To this day, I've been using the same marketing. You know, I've updated it a little bit, but for the most part, I've been using the same 16 point plan of action since my first day in the business. And it has everything that I'm going to do to sell their house. And a lot of the stuff on there is stuff that the office does. Some of the stuff on there is the benefits of being with Keller Williams. Some of the stuff on there are some specific things that I'm going to do. But there's 16 things. And here's the thing. Every market is different. Every agent's different. Every style is different. You may revise this plan. You may update this plan based on the consumer's needs. See, a lot of appointments you go on, especially on the high end, which there's tons of luxury panels this week, their demands and their needs are a little different. So I might not take out that same 16 point plan of action that I'll use on a $200,000 house, let's say. So you may have to modify it given, you know, depending on the, the, the type of presentation that you're going on. Simple plan of action, doesn't have to be complex. Doesn't need to be, you know, 92 points, don't confuse them. Hey, this is from start to finish, everything we're going to do to get your home sold. Do you feel I can sell your home based on this? Yeah, it looks pretty good to me. Okay, good, now let's move on. The other couple other things you may wanna have on there, how you promote the home to other agents locally and nationally. I know in some markets, print advertising is still strong. Uh, you know, sellers love to see print advertising, especially on the high end. And here's the thing I think a lot of people are missing out on. We take it for granted, because we're in it every day. Social media. Right, we're on it every day. We're boosting posts, we're making posts, we're creating flyers, we're doing this. The average consumer thinks that there's a lot of work that goes into social media advertising. So I'm gonna play up to that and I'm gonna point out all the things we're doing on social media. I'm gonna share with them how we're gonna promote their listing, we're gonna promote their open house, we're gonna boost the post, we're gonna, we're gonna draw, they love this one, we're gonna draw a circle around your neighborhood and promote it to your neighbors, why? Just listed, just sold calls. That should be on your plan of action. What do you mean just listed, just sold calls? When we take a listing, we're calling the neighbors to let them know of the listing we just took. 
Well, why would you do that? They don't want to buy a house in their neighborhood. No. But if they live in the neighborhood, chances are they love the community. They love the neighborhood. They may know of someone that's looking to move. Mr. and Mrs. Sel Mr. And Mrs. Neighbor, this is your opportunity to pick your new neighbor. So just like we would do a Just Listed, Just Sold circle prospecting campaign around a new listing, I'm sharing with the seller how we're going to promote their listing to their neighborhood. And if I am doing a prospecting campaign afterwards, that's a bonus. There's two points right there. We're already on our way to 16. Next, the pricing strategy. If, 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 if you don't walk away with this point, I would write this down and underline it and circle it seven ways till Sunday. The majority of listings are either won or lost in the pricing discussion. The majority of the appointments we go on are either won or lost in the pricing discussion. Well, if you tell them a number that's too high, they may think you're a little unrealistic and that you're just trying to buy their listing. And if you tell them a number that's too low, they may think you're trying to give their home away. So what will you do? I'll share that with you now. This is exactly what I do. By the way, I'm going out, right now I'm going on five, six listing appointments a week. Uh, you know, I try, to, I try to stagger them through the week. My favorite day to go on listing appointments, by the way, is Saturday. It is by far, my conversion rate on Saturdays is, is, is almost 15 to 20% higher than it is during the week. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, people are in better moods on Saturdays. Okay, people want to get chores done. People want to check things off their list. So whenever possible, I almost never go on appointments on Thursday or Friday. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday. I'm pushing all of the Thursday and Friday appointments to Saturday. And I'm going on them back to back to back. Anybody heard the term batching? Yes, batching. Your skill level and your efficiency when you're doing something back to back one after another is higher than when it is you're doing stuff in between. Think of it. On a random Wednesday, okay, you had your typical day at the office, a deal fell apart, uh, things aren't going so hot, you got this listing coming up, I need to get ready for it, you head out to the listing, maybe you get a contract signed, maybe you don't, you're thinking about you know, picking up the kids and what you have to do afterwards. On a Saturday, your schedule is clear. I go into the office for one thing and that is to grab every appointment I'm going on for that day. I'm in, I'm out, that's all I'm doing. I have a 9.30, a 10.30, an 11.30, and a 12.30, and I'm done until Monday at 8 a.m. I'm getting more contract signed on Saturday than any other day of the week. All right, let's go back to the pricing strategy. So, pricing. I think one of the big mistakes that a lot of agents make is they confuse the consumer. They give them way too many options, way too many things to think about. So when I, when I share with you Okay, bring out all the homes that you or your, your team or the market center has sold over the last three to five years. I'm not, that's not the pricing strategy. That's the value. That's why, here, hey, here you go. That's why you should consider us. Okay, that has nothing to do with this discussion. That's a separate deal. The pricing strategy is very simple. Three to five actives and three to five solds. And I don't put them in all kinds of fancy graphs. I print off a one page. I call it a listing ticket because that's what we called it back in the day. It's a one page, hey, here, here's our three to five uh, most recent sales. These are going to be the same properties that show up in your appraisal. Oh, by the way, we should probably have a discussion about the appraisal, future pace them for, hey, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I say, it doesn't matter what the buyer says, it doesn't matter what you say. It all comes down to, in most cases, what the appraiser thinks your home is worth. And so let's take a look at these solds through the eyes of an appraiser. That's my dialogue. So if you're not writing this down, I would. Let's take a look at these most recent sales in the eyes of an appraiser. Well, why would I do that? Well, I'm future pacing them for the fact that we may have an appraisal issue. Okay, I know the market's changing a little bit, so we should be okay for a little while. But at the end of the day, appraisal issues are still happening, are they not? Yes, they're happening. I see a lot of head shaking. 
So I'm preparing with them for that possibility by talking about, let's look at these in the eyes of an appraiser. Forget about the buyer, forget about the seller. How is the appraiser going to look at these comps and compare your home to this? Great thing to do on pricing. Send them a pre-listing package with the three to five actives and the three to five solds in advance. Can I email it? No. Okay, you can, but they won't open it. Mail it to them, drop it off, have your runner take it out. Get them the comps in advance. So that way when I call back to do the pre-qual, they'll already have an idea of what I'm thinking in terms of price because they've seen the comps in advance. Sending a pre-listing package is one of the quickest ways to increase your conversion by five to 10%, just like that. If you just send a pre-listing package in advance, you're going to increase your conversion. Now I know that sometimes it's tough, okay, you, you, you talk to a seller on a Monday and they want you out the next day. Well, there's gonna be some cases where you just can't do it. But I'm actually building in time for the pre-listing package to go out. So if I'm talking to someone on a Monday, I might set it up for Wednesday. You know, if, as you know, if I'm talking to someone on Thursday, it's for sure I'm going out on Saturday. I'm giving myself at least a day or two to get a pre-listing package out, and I'm putting the comps right in it. And I'm sharing with them, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, my job is to be as honest and upfront with you about the price. Oh yeah, we really want that. That's my job. I'm not going to come in here and tell you what you want to hear just to get another listing. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I'm not actually interested in getting another listing. I'm interested in helping you sell this home. So if it's all right with you, I'm going to be brutally honest with you about what I think your home will end up appraising for and ultimately selling. Fair enough? Of course they want that. They're gonna say yes every time to that. And in most cases they're gonna say, oh yeah, the last agent you know, told us some number that was out there and, and yeah, we're not gonna go with them because I don't think they really know the neighborhood well. They value that, that honesty and that somebody telling them the truth. So when I go through the three actives, or three to five actives and three to five solds, and we arrive at a figure, I'm giving them a range, but the range is only maybe 5% high or 5% low. The number that I'm telling them is the number that I believe the home will sell for. I'm going to share with them a figure because they, they're going to ask, well, what do you think it's worth? Now, here's the thing. I'm always, no matter what, we go through the three to five actives, three to five solds. Based on everything I've shared with you, what price do you feel your home is worth? I'm always asking their opinion first, and eight times out of 10, they say, well, you're the expert, why don't you tell us what you think? Okay, I get that, I'm prepared for that, so I already have my number in mind, and I'm sharing with them what I believe the home will sell for. Okay, watch where I'm going with this. So let's say we're looking at comparables, homes 200, 250,000, somewhere in that range. Based on the three actives and the three solds, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, what price do you feel we should set on your property to get a buyer to buy your home versus the competition? That's a script, by the way. Well, we were hoping you would tell us. Of course, I know they're going to say that, okay? So I throw a number out there. Well, based on what I'm, what I'm seeing, what's been listed, what's been sold, it looks like it's gonna come in right around 225. And I wait for the reaction. And it's always this. List price? No, no, no. That's what it's worth. And I wanna see the reaction when I throw the number out there because they may be ready to throw me out the door or they may be ready to have a little bit more of a conversation. So I'm prepared to, to change my tune and grab the comps again and spread them out on the table and make sure that they're in front of them and go through them again one by one to make sure we're on the same page. Because a lot of times all they hear is the number and they don't care about the logic behind it. They had a number in mind, it's not the number, so let's move on. And then they want you to talk about what you're gonna do to sell their house and all that other stuff. No, no, no. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, 
based on everything that we've seen, how do you feel about 225? Well, we think it's a little low. You know, we were really hoping for 250, right? So I know they're going to say that I'm prepared for that in most cases. And I grab all the comps, I lay them out again and say, okay, well, let's, let's take a look at it through the eyes of an appraiser. And let's make sure we get this right the first time, because if we screw this up the first time on the market, you could cost yourself thousands later. That's my dialogue. And by the way, most of them get that. Most of them understand that. Most of them know the whole overpricing and the listing becomes stale, but I still remind them. I still remind them that after, after 21 days on a market, a listing becomes stale. Less people look at it, less offers come in on it. So we don't have, we have a little short window to get this right. And if we don't get it right, by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that happens sometimes. We need to adjust quickly. So I'm already future pacing them for a reduction. And it makes it a little bit easier because in my listing packet is a price, a pre-price reduction form where I write out some potential prices that we may have to go to if we end up taking the listing overpriced. Now I'm not writing in the dates that we're going to adjust because we truly don't know until we put it out there and see how buyers respond, but I'm preparing them for it. I'm getting their commitment that if this price doesn't work, we might have to adjust to these numbers. And I'm having them sign it. And it just says to be determined. Right, so this means, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we're gonna have a discussion about this. This just means I prepared you what the worst case scenario could be. Well, that doesn't mean we're agreeing to it, does it? No, no, no. We still need to have a conversation. We're still going to talk before we go do any kind of price change and I'll still need to get your approval to do that. But I'm preparing them for that at the listing presentation. And oh, by the way, if you get a listing at a good price and you don't think you'll need it, I still present it. I still present it, and I always wait until after the contract sign. Why is that? Well, you don't want to give them one more reason why they may not sign a contract with you. So I'm having that conversation after listing, after listing sign. Well, how does that go? What does that look like? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I think we've picked a great price, and I'm super excited about getting the home on the market uh, for you and go to work for you and your family. And it's, it's, I wouldn't be doing my job as a great salesperson if I didn't let you know that the market prices are fluid. Prices can go up and prices can go down based on what's happening in the market. Well, how does that work? Well, if we've got a home that comes on the market across the street from us and it's just as good if not better for a lower price, that affects our market value. If a house sells down the street and it's better for a, better pro, you know, for a lower price, that could be conceived as a better value. So it's important that we understand that I have to pay attention to what's going on in the neighborhood while I have this listing, and then I will call you in two weeks and let you know what took place. My goal is that when I call you in a week or 10 days or two weeks, I'll have some great feedback and hopefully a good offer for you. But if I don't, we may need to discuss the price. I'm preparing them for that conversation at the kitchen table when I'm taking the listing. If I don't do that at the table, it's extremely difficult for me to call them later when I was so excited about this price and taking this listing and oh my gosh, this is a great price, we're gonna get this house sold and then two weeks nothing happens and I call them and say we have to reduce the price. That's not a fun phone call. That's not fun at all. So I wanna prepare them for that while I'm sitting at the table. Next, let's talk about the pre-listing and the pre-qualifying process. So there's a script out there, it's called the pre-qualifying script. Most of you have probably seen it by now. So I'm just going to give you, in my opinion, the five questions that you always ask. This is a discussion that you have with the seller prior to going out. You cannot skip any of these questions. They are by far the most important questions on the pre-qual script. And I don't care what order you ask them in, I don't care if you leave off the, some of the other questions. Do not go out on a presentation without asking these five things. And you'll want to write these down. This is my favorite one. I start off every prequal conversation with this one. And it's coincidentally question number one on the script. 
And by the way, it is probably the most commonly left out questions when we talk to agents. Yeah, I pre-qualled them. Okay, well, how'd it go? Well, they said they owe this and this. Okay, but did you ask them if they're ready to get the home on the market when you get out there? Well, no, I kind of left that one off. Okay, why did you do that? Well, I didn't want to, you know, make them upset or sound pushy. It's not pushy at all. Listen to the logic in this question. I do not go out on a listing presentation without asking this question of every single seller, and I ask it two or three different ways until I get an answer that I'm satisfied with, and that is this. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we appreciate the opportunity to go to work for you. I'm looking forward to meeting with you Tuesday at four o'clock, and I just have a couple of questions. The first question I have to ask is, if what I say makes sense, and you feel, I'll repeat this a few times, if what I say makes sense, and you feel 100% comfortable and 100% confident in my abilities of getting your home sold, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, before I come out, a few questions. If what I say makes sense, you feel 100% comfortable and 100% confident in my abilities of getting your home sold, will you be ready to get the home on the market? Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if what I say makes sense, you feel comfortable and confident in my abilities of getting your home sold, will you be ready to put me to work? Okay, eight or nine out of 10 will not say yes. One out of 10 will, by the way, I love that seller. <laughs> One out of 10 will say yes, yeah, I think so. If what you say makes sense, we'll be ready to go. And you know what, I've got a really good feeling when I'm going out on that one. The other ones, I'm not asking the question because I want to just automatically get, get a listing. I'm not asking the question because I feel like I just deserve it and I'm only going to meet with you if you're going to sign with me. That's not why I'm asking it. And that's why it's not a pushy question. I'm asking the question, and I think this is the number one reason why a lot of agents leave this question off because they don't actually understand the true logic behind it. And that is, I'm only asking this question to see what's stopping them from doing business with me or anyone right now. I wanna know right now the objections before I get to the house. If I leave that question off and they say to me when I get there, well, uh, you know, Jeff, we're really not thinking about doing anything until the summer, so uh, we appreciate you coming out and, and uh, we'll let you know. Okay, it would have been nice to know that before I decided to go on that appointment. Or, well, you know, um, my husband's up north right now, and, and he's on vacation. He's doing a, he's in a skiing trip. Uh, he won't be home until next week. So uh, if you could just you know share with me, and I'll share with him, right? Okay, no, I don't want to be on that appointment. And I would have found that out if I would have asked the question, Mr. Mrs. Seller, if what I say makes sense, and you feel 100% comfortable and confident in my ability of getting your home sold, will you be ready to put me work put me to work when I come out on Saturday at 10:30? Well. You know, the thing is, we've got a few more interviews lined up. Ah, okay, they're meeting with a few more agents. Not a problem. I understand that. I respect you interviewing agents. This is a big decision, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, great. And I'm making a note of that. Whatever they tell me, I'm not fighting them on it unless it truly doesn't make sense for me to go out on that appointment. But I want to be prepared. And when I ask that question, I will be better prepared for that appointment because of the answer that they give me. Number two, and if you're writing this down, I want you to write in parentheses personality style. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, depending on who I have on the phone, because I usually don't have them on speaker, will you please describe your home for me? Sounds basic, but let me tell you where I'm going with this. Will you please describe your home for me? Who's been on the call when you've asked this question? Well, let's start with we've got uh, stainless steel uh, nails that we've used to make sure that there's no squeaks in the floor. Uh, we've got 18 and a half. I'm sorry, maybe it was 18 and three quarters. Honey, do you know, uh, what is the insulation in the, you know, they're telling you these things that don't matter. But what I'm doing is I'm identifying who they are. By the way, who was I just describing there? Okay, the high C, the analytical, right? So I'm able to pick up, right, the driver. Uh, what do you need to know? 
Don't, don't you have that information? Okay, he's a driver. Yep, you're right, I have that information and I appreciate you sharing that with me. I'm gonna do a little bit of research before I come out. Next question, right? <laughs> I'm finding out who they are and I'm adapting my style to them, but that's one of the quickest ways to find out the personality style of the person you're presenting to. And by the way, in most cases, the other one is the opposite, right? Next question. You can't leave this one off. When I see you, what price do you want to list your home for? When I see you, what price do you want to list your home for? Pretty basic. Well, first of all, what am I doing there? I'm assuming that I'm going to get the listing. And, and by the way, all through the entire presentation, it's an assumption. It is, it is the ultimate of assumptions from start to finish that I'm getting this listing. There is no question in my mind, I don't care if they're interviewing others, I'm, I'm getting this listing. So I'm going to talk to you like I already have the listing. The dialogue that I use in the pre-qual script and from the minute I, I'm greeting them at the door, hey, thanks for having me out, I'm looking forward to going to work for you and more importantly, getting your home on the market and getting it sold. Thanks, uh, if you don't mind, if you could show me the kitchen, I'd appreciate that. I'm assuming the listing from the start. Oh, wow, this is a gorgeous backyard. This is really going to show well on our internet marketing. I'm gonna make a note of that. I'm assuming the listing the entire time. So when I see you, what do you wanna list your home for? And of course, in most cases, they don't have a number. Well, that's why we're having you out, Jeff. Okay, good, follow-up statement to that. It's a question, it's a statement with a question. As a professional real estate agent, I study homes and prices every day. Therefore, I assume you'll list your home with me at a price that will cause it to sell, correct? No matter what they say, well, we were hoping you would tell us. Well, we were thinking 250. Well, we really don't know. Well, we've got four interviews. Well, I really need you to take a look at my basement and tell me what you think it's worth. Well, uh, our garage is falling apart and I don't know really what the home is worth. No matter what they say, perfect. As a professional real estate agent, I study homes and prices every day. Therefore, I assume you'll list with me at a price that will cause your home to sell, correct? Again, the embedded commands, that's the NLP in there, the language of sales. Finally, I would not leave this one off. Question number five. And by, by the way, these, can be, these are in any order. You know, I, I always start off with question number one, of course, that I shared at the beginning, but you can insert these anywhere into this script. Will all the decision makers be present? Will all the decision makers be present? Well, what do you do when they say no? Well, you know, I tell our agents, you have to trust your gut. Meaning, will this person get offended if I try to reschedule on them when both decision makers are present? And depending on how the call has gone, you don't know until you've gone through that call. So I don't really have a line in the sand on that one. I tell our agents and I do the same thing. I just trust my gut. You know what, this person is the decision maker there's a good chance I'm gonna get a contract signed and I can follow up with the other, you know, the spouse or significant other later to get their signature. I'm gonna go out and present and assume I'm getting a contract signed and I'm gonna ask them to sign the contract and of course, I'll go back and get the other one later if I need to. Next, the pre-listing package. We talked about it a little bit earlier. I wanna make sure you have the following six things in your pre-listing package. And I don't care how fancy it is, how, how decked out, how dressed up, just make sure you have these things in it, okay? Number one, your resume of some sort. And by the way, mine's evolved over the years. You know, initially, I was in furniture sales before I got into real estate, so I talked about how I have all this sales experience and how I won sales awards and I can, I can sell your home just like I sold furniture, okay? I had no choice, I started in the business brand new, that's all I knew. Okay, now it's evolved, now it talks a little bit about uh, you know, the results that we've had and, and uh, uh, you know, some of the great things about Keller Williams and of course what we're doing as a group. The second thing, you have to have this, a plan of action. A plan of action, and listen, Keller Williams has some great tools out there. Make it your own. You can use the Keller Williams one if you're a year or less in the business 
or you're just kind of getting started with taking listings, fine. Have an individual plan of action. And simple, one page, clear, concise. You know, you can use pictures, you can use words, whatever you want, just make it simple. Next, important nowadays, especially with online, reviews. Reviews, not testimonials. Nobody believes testimonials anymore. You're gonna send them, of course, all the good ones. It's okay to send them some bad reviews. Bad reviews actually validate the good ones. So assuming you have some great reviews, send them your reviews. Number four, your, your market stats, your office stats, your team stats, especially if you're dealing with a high analytical, anything to do with stats, this would probably be the only personality style that I would overwhelm with statistics. Well, that's not my style. I don't believe that we need to go through 17 pages of statistics to determine the value of their home and, and to help them decide why I'm the one for them. Well, that's because I'm not an analytical. I don't see the value in that. Looks good, makes sense, let's do it. Okay, for you drivers out there, that's how it goes. Well, if I know I'm meeting with an analytical, I can't have that attitude. Otherwise, I'm going to lose the listing to an analytical agent. So I'm almost overwhelming them with stats. Next, state disclosures. You have a seller's disclosure statement in most states. I'm sending those out in advance and asking them to fill them out and having them prepared for our appointment. Assuming the listing. Listen, from start to finish, I'm getting the listing. So I'm talking to you already as if I'm your listing agent, which means I'm going to need seller's disclosures for you to tell me what's going on with the house to help get the price right. Finally, number six, pre-listing package, comps. Comparables, three to five actives, three to five solds, the same ones that you're gonna bring to their appointment. And at, at, while you're at it, a suggested price. Well, wait a minute, how do you do that? You haven't seen the house yet. You can give a range. I'm okay with the range as long as the actual value of the home is right smack dead in the center and you're not going much over than that. Because if you go higher than that, you're doing them a disservice. And I get it. There's going to be some appointments that you go out on and it's gonna make sense to list it a little bit higher than the range you gave because you didn't realize the work they did to their lower level or to their backyard or whatever it was. And that's okay, I, in fact, I want this pre-listing package to go out and I want them to see the comps so they call me and say, hey Jeff, we saw what you sent out, but um, you, know, you know that our, our home is uh, uh, a two-story, right? Oh, I sent you all ranches, I'm sorry, yep, I'll make a note of that. Okay, how embarrassing would it be, by the way, we've all been there, if you've been on listing appointments, I've done this. You get to the house, oh, this is great, you pull up, it looks nothing like what you pulled up in public records or whatever history you had on it. All of a sudden, you're sitting at their table, and, and for me, a lot of times, I'm looking at the comps for the first time while I'm at their table, and I'm looking at the comps, and I'm looking at them, and I'm looking at the comps, and I'm looking at them. Okay, we're gonna two-step this one, so let's go ahead and take a look through the house, and I'll get back to you with what I think it's worth. That's gonna happen sometimes. Gotta act quick. Comps with suggested price range, got it, all right, good. Next, oh, this is my favorite. Prior to arrival, oh, this is my favorite. My first few years in the business, anybody know that song by the OJs? What's, how's it go? Money, 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 money. So I had a CD, you know, this is back when everyone had CDs in their car. I had a CD and it had one song on it and it was that song. That's it, only song on the CD. And I had a routine, I pulled in the driveway because it would pump me up. It would clear my mind of whatever happened on the way over there. We have a saying in our office and it's plastered all over. Flip the switch at the door. I don't care what happened to you on the way in this morning, what happened last night, what kind of fight you got into, you know, who, who, who kicked mud on you, uh, you know, if you had a flat tire on the way in. Yeah, those are all unfortunate circumstances. But you know what? When you walk through the doors of JGA, you flip that switch and you don't bring it into this environment. Because not only are you, harming, are you harming the environment and the culture for yourself and your own personal productivity, you're harming it for everyone else around you. Flip the switch at the door, same thing, okay? I, it's as silly as it sounds, I actually picture when I'm showing up to a, a, a homeowner's house and I'm standing on their porch 
it's like, ah, there it is. There's a little switch on my back. Flip it. All right. It's showtime. Let's go. Let's do this. Ready? Ding, ding, ding. All right. Hey, Jeff, right? I'm a whole different person. It doesn't matter what happened to me on the way there. I am ready to go like I'm on stage today. And it is showtime, and I'm putting on a performance, and I am getting this listing, and I'm not leaving the, the house without it. That's my mindset. And that's the mindset when you flip the switch. Next, let's talk about the presentation a little bit. Simple steps, make the introduction, share value, consult the property, close to an agreement, set the follow-up. I'm gonna walk you through each one. What was your question? I'll go back. Let them know what to expect at the meeting, ask them to gather inner information needed, there, there you have it. No, I'm just, I'm just I'm letting them know what we're going to cover when we come out, which is basically the pre-qualification script. And, of course, I'm letting them know that, you know, they've received the seller's disclosure statement. I'm asking them to have that handy and ready to go when I get to the house because I'm going to need to, to, to review that to help them determine the right price. Thank you. Okay, presentation itself. Let's talk about the introduction. Pretty simple stuff here. I mean, we've, we're all in sales, so I don't need to necessarily talk to you about, you know, have a firm handshake, look them in the eyes. But I do have a few notes written down here. I, said, I have written down here, remember, match and mirror. Okay? You may think that, listen, I'm pretty good at this stuff. I took five listings last month. I got a couple of them pending. I'm just going to show up, and I'm going to do my thing. No. Okay, I can't tell you how many lessons I've learned been going out on presentations and, and presenting the way that I think makes sense. I am molding myself to them from the minute that they open the door. And I'm thinking about the introduction that I need to make, how strong I need to be, how soft I need to be, how fast my rate of speech is, how slow the rate of speech is. I'm having the versatility. Taking a quick tour of the house. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, do you mind if I just set my stuff here on the kitchen table? Great. Let's take a quick look around if it's all right with you. And while I'm doing that, I'll have you take a look at our plan of action. You should have already received it. I'll have you take a look at our plan of action, everything we're going to do to sell your home. And I'm going to take a quick look through the house. Is that okay? Do you want one of us to show you around? Well, if you'd like to, if you'd feel more comfortable, one of you can show me around and I'll have the other take a look at our plan of action. Fair enough? Obviously, this is fast for a presentation. I'm not talking that fast when I'm with them. I'm having one sit back at the table and review the listing plan of action. Why? Because I don't really want to present it to them. Okay? I want to get the listing without getting the plan of action. Why? Because the listing plan of action might take me another 10 or 15 minutes to present. And if I can get one to sit back at the table and review the plan of action while I'm touring the house, then all we have to do is, when we get back to the table is talk about their goals, their needs, their wants, and the price, and then, of course, closing for a signature. So I'm sitting, after we do the tour, I'm sitting down at their table. And it's a Q&A based conversation. It's, it's not this, hey, let me show you everything that I, I sent you here. I know I sent you a lot of stuff. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. You know what, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I really want to get to know a little bit about you and what you're looking to accomplish. So if it's all right with you, I'd just like to ask you a series of questions. And sometimes, there, you know, there, there's, it's the listing presentation script, by the way. It's just, where are you going? How soon do you need to be there? What's your timeline? How soon could you be out of your home? How soon do you want to be in the next house? Why are you moving? How long have you lived here? What did you pay for the house? I'm just going through a simple Q&A with them. It's nothing complicated. It's right there in the listing presentation script. But I'm making it about them. I'm finding out what's important to them in their move. And I'm going through some good questions. With, you know, I'm, I'm getting deep with them. You know, if the home doesn't sell, what will you do? We don't have an option. We have to sell. Okay, I can understand that. Yeah, we have a house that's being built. Uh, it's going to be ready in about three or four months, so we really need to get this house on the market. Awesome. So what happens if your home sells and closes, and you're out of this house before your home is ready? We've already arranged for, for um, you know, interim living. Oh, perfect. So we can offer immediate occupancy to the buyer. Absolutely. So that's really what it sounds like, and that's what I'm doing for about five or seven minutes. And then I'm finishing that conversation with, okay, great. Let's see if I can help you get this home sold. And I'm going right into, you know, just some spe spe specifics of why you should consider us and so forth. And really, it's still 
all about them. It's not just me talking about our successes and everything we've done. It's all about them, what's going on in the market, some things that they need to be prepared for. Uh, again, I'll show you the infographic in a little bit uh, about our story, if you will. Consult on the property. We talked about this a little bit, right? The CMA, three actives, three solds. I'm taking out whatever information that I already have about the house and I'm confirming all the information. We just did the tour, so if I was doing the tour correctly, I would have taken notes. By the way, one of the biggest mistakes you can do is have, have a seller show you th through their house and not take notes. You might as well just tell them that you're not interested in their home. Take notes when you're with the seller as they're walking you through. And by the way, I have all the notes, so I'm confirming the notes I took. Analyticals, of course, love that. Oh good, he took notes. He's gonna remember our house. I'm going with the, th I, I'm uh, confirming how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms. Updates to the home, square footage, anything that they can tell me. We talked about the CMA. Closing, one of my favorite parts. So obviously, once I've shared with them the price, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, do you feel I can sell your home? Very simple, easy close. Do you feel I can sell your home? And by the way, they almost never say no. So don't be afraid to ask the question. Now, they might lie to you and say yes, <laughs> but that doesn't mean they're gonna say no. You know, usually what I get is, yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, I think we feel pretty comfortable with what you've shared with us. Okay, good. Are you ready to put me to work for you? And I zip it. I don't say another word until they talk. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, do you feel that I can sell your home? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you've given a pretty good spiel here, and, you know, we feel like you're pretty well qualified, and we agree with you on, on price, so I guess we're good there. Great. With a big smile. Are you ready to put me to work for you? Well, we have, see, the thing is, we have a few more agents coming out. Darn it, I forgot to ask that question in the prequel. Okay, no, I did ask the question, so I know that I'm already expecting that. And of course, remember, I don't care. I'm not responding to that, I'm not getting worked up about that. In most cases, I don't even care who they're meeting with. I'm assuming the listing all the way through. I'm assuming I'm going to get this listing contract signed. And this is usually where the objections come up. So I'm going to give you five rules on handling objections because this is where they come up. If they're not going to come up on the price, which they will, and the nice thing is there's a price objection script out there, but in this setting, I don't have time to go through the whole script with you, so I'm gonna give you the five rules on handling any objection, even if it's price. I use this every time. Number one, always smile when you go to respond. It sounds so basic, but if you don't think to do it, I guarantee if I went in and videotaped your listing presentations, the moment you get an objection, unless you practice this every single day like I have for the last 13, 14 years, the moment you get an objection, your face is gonna be like. <laughs> and everything is going to change. The tone is going to change. The consumer's going to pick up on your, your, you're getting a little agitated and you're not happy with what they just asked or what they said. Everything changes. So since we know that's going to happen, your heart beats a little faster, you might start sweating, you might turn a little red, you're thinking about an answer. Crap, they told me to practice scripts. I knew I should have did this. Instead, I'm smiling, no matter what they say. Well, Jeff, you know, we still have a few more agents to interview. Oh, that's right, you mentioned that on the phone, and I can certainly appreciate you have a few more agents coming out. And I'm curious, based on everything I've presented to you today, is there anything you're looking for different in an agent that you hire? Well, Jeff, one thing you mentioned is that your commission is 6%, and we were really hoping to get right. So I'm gonna draw out the objections by doing that. But if you notice there, number one, no problem. What's the objection? Oh, well, you're, you're, you know, we're not too crazy about your price. I can certainly understand that. Number two, always agree, never argue. Number two rule on handling objections. Always agree with what they say 
and never argue. Well, you know, we were really hoping that you'd be willing to give us a little bit of a discount since we're going to be buying a house through you. I can certainly appreciate that. And ultimately, you want to net the most out of this move so you have money to take to your next home. Is that right? Yes, it is. That's exactly what we want. Okay, I just agreed with them. I just told them that I'm with you. I get it. Okay, you'll see where I'm going with this. Number three, always nod your head and watch your body language. Always nod your head. I can certainly understand where you're coming from. I would want to net the most out of this sale too. I'm with you. Always smile, always agree, never argue, always nod your head and keep in mind your body language. Number four, follow up the agreement with a statement of agreement sentence. Right, so my body language and my tonality and everything is saying I agree, but I need to have something to say. So I, I wrote a long, long time ago a list, no joke, I wrote a list of 10 to 12 statements of agreement. And I don't use the same one over and over because it would sound weird. So, you know, it's things like, I can appreciate that, I understand how you feel, I know where you're coming from, I'm with you on this, I can certainly appreciate your feelings on this. I have 10 to 12 statements of agreements that I wrote out a long, long time ago that just come to mind every time I need to handle an objection. So I always am ready for a statement of agreement. And number five, no matter what, under all circumstances, do not use the word but. Replace it with the word and. Do not use the word but. Replace it with the word and. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I can understand, you know, where you're coming from, but I don't really think that it's going to make any difference, right? I mean, how could you possibly gain any agreement or continue the level of rapport that you have when you respond with something and use the word but? It's like saying, I love those shoes, but with that dress, I don't know. They forgot everything that you said about the shoes and are only paying attention to what you said about the dress. The but negates everything before it. Think about in our everyday human language how often we use the word but or however. The word however is the same thing. It's just dressed up a little nicer. However means but. Okay? So replace the word but and however with the word and. And it's amazing. When you get the habit of doing this day in, day out, you start to write emails. And you start to have sentences in your emails where it's like, and have you considered, and you know, I was wondering, and, and you're using the and over and over and over and over and over, and you're causing people to continue to listen to what you have to say versus negating everything you set up until that point. Finally, the follow-up. Prep them for what's about to happen. Set up for the listing process. Let them know what's going to happen after the contract signs. When possible, get their agreement on the next step while you're at the house. Schedule photos, take the photos. Schedule the lockbox, put the lockbox on. It's ha you know, when you're out on a lot of appointments and you get a, little, a lot of contracts signed, from time to time, they're going to have a change of heart there's less of a chance you're going to have a change of heart if you've already went to work for them. If you've been on listing appointments, you've got contracts signed, we've all gotten this call. You know, I, I hope it's still early enough to cancel. Uh, we've, we've just had a change of heart. Uh, you know, we changed our mind. We want to go in a different direction. It happens. If you're going to go on a lot of appointments, it's going to happen. It's less likely to happen if I've already started work. So while I'm at the table, I'm scheduling photos, I'm putting the lockbox on, I'm putting a sign in the, you know, I'm doing something to show that I'm starting work on it. Less likely that you'll get a cancellation. And if you don't get the contract signed, which by the way, I said when we started this, from now on you're all getting 60% or more of the listing you go on. And if you're already getting that number, then you're not going on enough appointments of people that you don't know. So since we know there's going to be some that we don't get, we're setting up a follow-up date, and no matter what they tell us, we're cutting it in half. If I'm out on a Saturday and they say, yeah, you know, we got to just give us until Wednesday or Thursday, I'm calling them Monday. 
And I'm acknowledging, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I'm not, you know, I, I acknowledge that you said you wanted to wait until Wednesday, and it's Monday. As you can tell, I'm pretty proactive and anxious to get your home on the market. And I just want to be sure you know, just like I'm following up with you right now, I'm going to be following up with buyers for your home the same way. You do want a good salesperson, don't you? Well, yeah, we do, but we just need a few more days. Not a problem. Just wanted to make sure I demonstrated my follow-through. I'll call you on Wednesday. Have a great day. Cutting the time in half, I'm acknowledging that I'm calling early, and I'm letting them know that this is exactly how I'm going to follow up with buyers when we have their home on the market. Remember, I'm always assuming that I have the listing. Okay, I promised you, I think I have one or two slides I want to share with you. Um, we've talked about this. This is your presentation, visuals, showing versus telling, so forth. This is just a, a, cover, sh uh, a cover sheet for a, a listing plan of action that we take out. And then this is the infographic that we use uh, when we go on listing presentations. So I have a mix of Keller Williams information on there. I have a mix of specific things that we actually do to sell houses, things that I believe would be important to consumers. We put it on a one-page infographic. People like these infographics nowadays. You got the data. It looks dressy. You know, it's got the Keller Williams red in there. It pops. That is our, in my opinion, that is our resume. So when I talk about put a resume together, even, and by the way, for, for, for seven, eight years, I used a sheet of paper with lines on it. So it's not like I'm some you know, genius that, that has been using this forever. So this is simple stuff that you can put together. We just got with a graphic artist on this and put our information together. Couple key takes away. Remember, selling isn't telling, it's asking questions. Okay, your visuals and the way you present need to match their style. And I think I have a note on here, just kind of a sidebar. Okay, I know some of you take out dis digital presentations. I don't recommend the digital presentation. I don't want the batteries to die. I want to leave them something of value at their home. So I hear all the time, oh, we do this I cool iPad presentation. Fine, if you're using it, it works for you, great. I believe in something that's traditional, leaving it behind if I don't get the listing because I know I'm going to be super aggressive in my follow-up. Again, I'm Jeff Glover from Detroit, Michigan. Thanks for coming. Enjoy the rest of the family reunion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.